Hi. Oh, that is a terrible welcome. Hello. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Some energy. This is an energy event, so energy. All right. Fantastic. All right. Excellent. Well, welcome, New York City, to uh, the 2013 installment of Clean Energy Connections. Um, we have an incredible panel for you talking about the future of energy storage. And um, if you've been tracking the sector at all, you know how challenging it's been. Uh, if you watched some sports on Sunday, you know that power quality is an issue that we're still grappling with. Um, and if the lights turn out in the middle of this, don't freak out. It will be okay, and we'll get things up and running in no time. Um, this event that we have um, is about something that we thought was critical to the future of um, renewables, right? You cannot have renewables. You can't have a serious discussion about scaling renewable energy without talking about energy storage. And um, not only are there serious issues around policy and chemistry um, and business, um, but it's the conversation has, I think, evolved beyond technology to talking about systems. Um, so what we're going to present to you is a deep dive on um, crossing the chasm and commercializing uh, energy stick energy storage technology, and you're going to hear from people in the field who are actually doing it, um, but we also want to hear from you. So as Sarah said, you know, hopefully someone asks a question about FERC Rule 755 um, <laughs> or current policies in the New York ISO. Um, our next Clean Energy Connections event is going to be in May uh, during Internet Week, and it's going to be on the future of clean web. Um, is everyone familiar with the topic of clean web, the intersection of energy and information technology. All right, well, we're very lucky because all the way from Austin, Texas tonight uh, is a guy named Blake Burris, and Blake runs something called Clean Web Worldwide. Um, we've worked together on a couple of Clean Web hackathons here in the city before. And so Blake, you can find him afterwards and ask him about Clean Web and the next hackathon, um, and he'll tell you a little bit about the next event that we're planning. So just a quick rundown of how this event goes. Uh, we're going to have uh, Zach Pollock, who is our moderator, coming out right now. And he's going to do a little bit of an opening. And then the panelists will be speaking. Uh, if you have questions for this panelist, we really encourage for this to be a discussion and not just a lecture. Um, In-person audience, you already know that you can use note cards to get them right to one of our card runners. Online audience, uh, feel free to tweet us at cleanecnyc, hashtag cleanenrgx. Um, and that's about it. We're pretty much ready to go. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors and our partners for making all of this possible. We really couldn't do it without all of you. And without further ado, please welcome Zach Pollock from GTM Research. Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. We already decided backstage that we, uh, we kind of want to see a lively discussion here. So if that doesn't happen, we're going to cut the uh, power in the third quarter. But uh, I just want to provide a little bit of context before we get going here, and I'll try to keep this brief. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I am a smart grid analyst with Green Tech Media. Uh, for many of you, you see the media side of the business and the event side of the business, but really what underpins uh, Green Tech Media's model is the fact that we do have a rather robust market research business in both solar and smart grid. Uh, next slide, please. So why be optimistic about uh, energy storage in 2013? If we look at some numbers up here, you know, what's highlighted here is that we did see rather, you know, uh, rather aggressive investing in, to, in 2012, and we expect to see that continue in 2013. Behind energy efficiency, energy storage was one of the most sought after sectors for venture capital, and this doesn't include investment activity for government grants and RPE and all the things along those lines as well. So we are optimistic about it, and we're optimistic about the way energy is going to be uh, managed, consumed, and what we're starting to see more is a transactive energy model is the, sort of the hot word for 2013. Next slide, please. So again, just uh, showing a different breakdown here, we can see a bunch of different, different players in the energy uh, storage space. We see fuel cell players, compressed air, liquid metal, lead acid. All these different players have a different application on the grid. And what we really want to drive home in this panel is that energy storage is pervasive. You know, it has a different value stream where you are in the grid and what you're doing with that application. And we as an industry can do a better job articulating that value stream in something that's been difficult for regulators, public utility commissions to understand in the past. 
And that's really one of the keys in moving the sector forward. Next slide. So this is uh, GTM's uh, taxonomy of what, what we consider smart grid. And you can see, I've highlighted on the bottom, that if you look at the physical structure of the power grid, storage has the potential to touch any of these areas on the actual physical grid. So there's diverse opportunities, but unquestionably, it's a fragmented market. And what I'd really like to get into tonight with some of the panelists here, and we have a great panel for you guys, is the fact that there are different value streams on the grid. And we need to understand those value streams and provide unique solutions for those actual applications before the sector can actually move forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. And if they want to come on out. So I have Dr. Bill Acker, well-known, highly regarded scientist and entrepreneur in the field of energy, currently at New York Best. Uh, Johannes Ritterhausen with Convergent Energy and Power, and Valerio DeAngelis with CUNY. So before we get started, uh, I'd just like to have everybody sort of go around and you know, tell us what you do and why you see some optimism in, in 2013 for the energy storage sector. Bill, if you'd like to get started. Very much so. So my name is Bill Acker, as uh, Zach just told you. I'm the executive director of, uh, of New York uh, BEST, which is the New York Battery and Energy Storage Technology Consortium. Uh, our group was uh, formed in 2010 to advance the energy storage industry in New York State and really around the world to advance the whole industry. Uh, and when we talk about energy storage, we're talking about transforming two of the largest industries on the planet, the transportation industry and the, uh, and the electricity grid. And although we've heard a lot about some of the challenges, it's important to remember that as these batteries advance and as we start to have these uh, technologies being deployed, and when I talk about these technologies, there are a whole array of them we'll get to tonight. As these are deployed, they will make dramatic changes in two very, very large industries. So I'm quite optimistic that we have the opportunity to bring forward a technology here in New York State and America that will be quite beneficial both to clean tech and also to economic development in the state. Great, thanks Bill. Johannes? Johannes Rittershausen, I'm here representing Convergent Energy and Power tonight. Uh, thanks to the organizers of this conference, first of all. About Convergent, we're an integrated energy storage asset developer. By integrated, that means the upfront economic valuation, the execution, and then the operations. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about a variety of different business models tonight, and I look forward to your questions. My name is Valerio De Angelis. I'm the executive director of the CUNY Energy Institute at City College. We started the energy storage program uh, five or six years ago, and we recently uh, got to the point where uh, the first type of energy storage technology we de developed in the lab is now ready to be commercialized. And in parallel, we have been looking at the value streams trying to get into the details of what the application requirements are and how these batteries need to be tested in order to actually be beneficial for uh, energy storage applications on the grid. At the end, uh, we are very optimistic about energy storage. Electricity is the only commodity that is not stored. Eventually, storage will uh, be a necessity on the grid at various levels. And, uh, we and other, many other vendors, we are trying different technologies that will ultimately reach the price point that is necessary. And Valeria, you signed a lease as of today to uh, scale your technology. Correct? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we signed the lease on 127th. We, tomorrow we're going to sign the lease. 127th <laughs> and Broadway Nicole for our first offices. So to, uh, to start off, you know, looking back at the past couple of years, it's been tough times, rather a tumultuous ride for energy storage vendors. We take a look at the, the Beacon Powers and the NR1s and the A123s. So you know, I don't want to dwell on what led, to, what led to the failures, bankruptcies of these companies, but I want to talk about you know, what we can learn from these companies and how the sector has changed moving forward. So Bill, if, you, if you'd like to start, that'd be great. Sure, and I, and I think you're absolutely right. We're, we're uh, you know, 
this is a very large industry that is that, that that is coming forward and it's going to have a lot of growing pains in doing that and it's got growing pains in a number of different ways it's have growing pains with the startup uh, companies and also in actually creating the markets and creating the right regulations and the right structures for the market so that everything can be properly valued um, one of the and each of the companies that you just mentioned had their own unique sets of issues um, it's interesting though to note that in both the case of beacon uh, and in the case of A123, you know, there is, uh, there is life after death, if you will. You know, sure. they went through their, their bankruptcy and actually have emerged on the other side and are, are doing some interesting things. And so uh, I'm pleased to see that both of those technologies are going forward. In the case of Beacon Power, this is a great example of a company's technology getting out a little ahead of uh, the right regulations in the marketplace. You know, Beacon Power uh, does frequency regulation on the electricity grid and it does it very, very well. The problem was, at that time, that you didn't get paid for doing it very well. You got paid for doing it. And so, you know, the fact that they did it better than everybody else, and in fact, one ISO study showed that they were doing 3% of the frequency regulation in New York State and doing 23% of the benefit. So they were disproportionately creating benefit, but not getting paid for it. And, um, you know, Mike mentioned FERC 755 coming in. We won't dwell on policy here, but actually FERC 755 corrected that issue. But it corrected that issue right at the time of the bankruptcy, not before it. And so, you know, we're now starting to see the regulations be put in place that allow these things to work better. Johannes, if you have some comments as well, we'll go down the line. Sure. Um, I actually may have a little bit of a controversial opinion for you here, but I think that this was an example of the wrong technologies and the wrong applications. Um, a lot of these, tech, these technologies were looking at a marketplace that was not developed, as Bill said, and they were trying to plug in wherever they could to make money, and they were trying to develop the technology at the same time they were doing that, and they were tackling the, in my opinion, the most complex industry that there is on the planet, which is the electricity grid, of the instantaneous matching of supply and demand every second of every day across you know, the entire grid, and they were trying to fit inside of this monster. Um, and they just, it's just too hard to do that um, in an early startup environment. And they were hit by the bow wave. Now we've learned a lot from them. Thankfully, they've pushed through, they've figured out a lot of things, and now we kind of know, okay, horses for courses, you know, race cars and tractors, all these um, uh, 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 metaphors that we have now for make sure that the business case makes sense and then make sure that the technology works in that business case. And if you don't, your company's going to go bankrupt. Yeah, my uh, this is actually there are many several there are several different reasons why some of these companies uh, couldn't make it at the end. Beacon Power I, I agree they they were uh, for many years a technology in search of an application and frequency reg and then they had to scale up their technology to get to the level of frequency regulation and when they ultimately did it they were a little bit too early. Uh, in that particular case. But they were somehow the pioneers that demonstrated that energy storage of whatever format can bring frequency regulation of increased value than traditional mm -hmm. gas turbines that were ramped up and down. That was one component of it. A123, A123 had, had a different uh, problem. They faced massive competition. From different from manufacturers in different countries, and you know we could go on and on forever. But I was in China looking at what BYD was doing at the price point in which they could do it. BYD is a lithium-ion manufacturer, uh, basically sponsored by the you know by the Chinese uh, government at some level, and they have energy storage demonstrations. They can flood the market with low-cost lithium-ion cells, and they one to three was found was faced with this situation in which they had to go upstream in the complexity of the application and they had problems. They had problems when they were making their car batteries and that was probably the last straw for them. But what they learned in the meantime, which I think has been extremely important for the industry as such, is the importance of system design. In fact, right now, a lot of the dispatch algorithms, a lot of the way we deploy energy storage at grid scale, is modeled after some of the work that they one to three did with AES in Jackson City. That is a very impressive demonstration that has really affected and built, maybe you know the number, but it's dramatically affected the frequency regulation market mm -hmm. in New York. And for these energy storage technologies to be competitive, 
I think the key is to continue to understand in detail what is the need of the applications and get together with the utilities, the transmission operators, the uh, wind farm operators to really understand at a very detailed level what their application needs are so that we stop testing batteries in the lab, but we know how they need to work on the field. I think if I, could, if I add one more piece to that, to, to Johannes' uh, controversy, your, 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 your point on horses for courses, I think it's right on the mark, in, in that the, the, one of the things that um, happened with A123 is that they were attempting to take on every market. And, uh, you know, they, they grew very rapidly through a large stimulus of manufacturing um, that may have gotten out in front of them a little bit. Uh, so, you know, they did some very, very good things, both in the automotive side and on the grid side. Um, but in the end, you know, it being it, having to take on every battery maker in the world in every single market is a, is a tall order for a startup, no matter how well capitalized they are. Now, the flip of that, which is kind of interesting, is if you look at the battery industry, almost no company has survived the transformation of technology. You know, you, you, you think of other industries, technology changes, and the market leader stays the market leader. In the battery industry, you know, when you think of batteries in the United States, you might think of Duracell, you might think of EverReady. They didn't make it into the lithium-ion world. The lithium-ion companies may not make it into, you know, the next waves of these things. So there was reason for A123 to believe in what they were doing, but they may have bit off more than they could chew. Which is also, uh, you know, at the end for them it was a necessity because they had to continue to go up in the value stream, right? right. So that they could justify the margins that they needed, the some uh, level, With right? that rate of growth. Yeah. Great. You had mentioned uh, China a little bit, Valerio, and you know, we look at the U.S. and for the most part we do have pretty good reliability. You know, if you compare amongst industrialized nations, you know, we fall behind a little bit, but. As a disruptive technology, how do you compare battery storage technology, or rather energy storage more broadly, in the U.S. compared to a country like China, where there isn't the same robust grid that's been built out yet? Yeah, this is, uh, you know, like, when you look at uh, innovation and how it develops in many different industries, and we, we, we like to use this term like disruptive technology, right? We always hear about technologies that disrupt the marketplace. And usually the way they, these things happen is somebody starts using something that is, doesn't work really well, right? but it solves a very specific need that somebody desperately needs to address. Right? And uh, we see this over and over and over with the uh, technology in many different fields. And there's, there are those early adopters that somehow you know, find a way to use the technology. And then over time, the technology gets better and better. Right? And then there is a point where the technology is good enough, just like what happened, for example, with the personal computers and workstations, where everybody can then adopt personal computer and the workstation dies. In some of these developing, developing countries, they have no energy. They really don't. So in, they do anything they can to get whatever energy they can get. So we visited some uh, um, uh, other countries uh, around the world, and we found, for instance, that they use solar panels, but they don't need to farm the solar energy because whatever they get energy, they use it. But at the same time, we also found situations in which people are thinking of installing uh, solar, centralized solar farms or wind farms heavily guarded and then have people carry their discharged battery to the farm, plug it in, charge it, and take it back home. Mm -hmm. And this is just a situation where people will just like to take home whatever energy they can. And the main driver, believe it or not, for this in these particular countries is that if the utilities, which don't exist, if utilities were to be formed and start putting wires, people would steal the wires. So instead of uh, building a distribution, there are other models in which you simply bring your own battery. Now, that's a driver. That's somebody has need for energy. And that's another way in which energy storage can become low cost, because it has to be low cost and dependable enough so that at some point can become attractive for markets in the United States at large. The alternative is in the United States instead, in which is what we are doing and many other vendors are doing, is to look for those high-value applications in which there is some need. But that's a much longer road to a disruptive technology, if you like. I would, uh, those are all correct, I think, comments. 
Um, however, I would add that the challenges and opportunities in the United States are kind of on the other end of the spectrum, right? In China and a lot of industrializing countries, they need to build a whole new grid. In this country, we have a challenge of our grid falling apart. And so this is where we have an opportunity to use energy storage over the next decade, two decades, to create economic and infrastructure value propositions that save people money, right? And so that's, it's an economic value proposition that, that we're pushing at Convergent, at least. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, the, the capacity factor, capacity factor, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the average usage over the peak usage. Capacity factor of the distribution system in the United States is in the high 30s um, percentage points, right? Which means that something like 60 to 70 percent of the time, we're not using all of these wires that are out there. And if we can figure out a way using energy storage to shift supply and demand to decouple the instantaneous matching, we can open up these opportunities to make uh, 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 to make money, essentially, for these projects. And the other wonderful thing I'd like to say about energy storage here is that very rarely in life do we have an opportunity to build a project or to do something which makes people money, potentially, but also lowers costs to the end consumer, right? Because the way that if you're doing energy storage right, the way that you're creating value is by reducing inefficiency. And by reducing inefficiency, you are... Uh, effectively lowering costs to the end consumer. So this is a, something that people can feel really good about. If they design a project right, they can build a project that makes sense for people, right? It makes sense for investors, it makes sense for utilities, and it makes sense for end users. And there, like I say, there are very few instances in life where you can, you can do something like that. Yeah, well, th let me just then maybe expand what I was saying. There are situations in the United States where, and I see that a lot in California, in Oregon, and other places, where b people are building their own solar in their house, and they're putting batteries. And those are perfectly uh, acceptable installations, and they get a return on investment in many cases of seven years. They use lead-acid batteries, and they work wonderfully well. Uh, there are also these pick-shaving applications, and which is what you were saying, you can use energy storage to level the, to, to use the infrastructure more effectively. And we see that happening, that is happening in the Pacific Northwest. They have a lot of wind generation and they need some energy storage to make sure they levelize the load. It's happening in this New York City where Consolidated Edison is relying a lot more on demand response, which is another way of doing storage. Instead of storing the energy, you save the energy. So I definitely think that in this country over the like next 10 years, 20 years, as you said, this will happen as soon as the utilities and the customers feel comfortable that the technology is where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the argument then is how do you bridge that gap? Yeah, I think the, 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 there are two couple of important pieces that just came out there. One, one is customers feeling comfortable with the technology. The, the other is is being able to have a mechanism that realizes this value because as, as was just pointed out you know when you have a when you have a system that's running at in New York State's a 42 percent capacity factor you know it has actually been designed just for the hottest August afternoon of the year and we put a lot of money into it for that hottest August afternoon of the year when you know those few hours a year when we are up to 32 gigawatts instead of being down at an average of 20 gigawatts for New York State or something lower we are going to have to rebuild the entire grid in New York State over the next 30 years. And, you know, the cost projections for the, for, for actually, I should say, the entire projection is 40 percent in the next 30 years. The cost projection of that is $25 billion. So the points that were just made is that energy storage can help you not have to put as much infrastructure in. You know, it's crazy to be adding more infrastructure when you're not using it. So energy storage can do that, but right now the regulations are not there mm -hmm. that allow you to actually realize that value. If Johannes uh, um, or Valerio puts a system in down here, they don't have any means of, cap of capturing the value of not having to run a new transmission line to New York City. And those things need to be figured out in order for this industry really to expand rapidly. I'd agree, but I'd also disagree. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say that we don't need more people to figure out how to make us more money through regulations, but I think that in the current regulatory climate, there are actually projects that you can do with technologies that have been around for 40 years that make sense for people. Um, I, I, I and, fully agree with And that. make sense for a lot of people. Um, enough people that we can start a company and build projects right now. Um, 
And so there are plenty of these proven technologies. There are lots of customers, especially right here in New York City, who have these value propositions, who pay several hundred thousand dollars a month for electricity, you know, 500 to a million dollars a month for electricity. A, a good proportion of that is weighted towards demand charges, which are literally the peak 15-minute interval from a month you get charged on, right? And so you bundle that together with the energy value, with the reliability value, with the infrastructure value that I was talking about that already exists, right, um, here in the city of Manhattan. And you can, we've, we've been putting together projects that have three-year paybacks, right? So, you know, it is an early market phase, and I, there are some things at FERC that need to be done to open up some of this transmission value and especially clean up some of the interconnection queues, things of that nature. But um, I wouldn't want to scare off anybody saying we need to wait five years before this happens. It's happening now. And in fact, you know, without getting into too much details, we do have projects, of course, both in New York City for demand charge reduction, which is what you were saying, which is basically people don't realize, but in the summer, they end up paying these large facilities, they pay 40 to $50 a kilowatt mm -hmm. for their uh, power. So a com an organization that for whatever reason consumes in uh, July or August more can really be hit by very high uh, energy bill. And that's definitely is an opportunity in New York City. And there are also other opportunities that are tangible. We are working with, some, with, with another organization. It's a larger organization that is now contemplating the cost that runs into the million of dollars of transmission versus using uh, um, energy storage. And again, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, um, the challenge and the opportunity is to really, as a vendor or as a scientist working in this space is to understand the requirements of the applications and to really do those detailed calculations to find the cases where you have a three years ROI. Mm -hmm. There are. Right. Oh, there absolutely yeah. are. I, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to be interpreted to say that I don't believe the markets are there now. I yeah. think there are markets there now that are very attractive for a number of different companies that are involved in the field. I think the, the difference is between being good markets to being, you know, $100 billion. So there's, there's a scaling issue mm -hmm. here, right? You, you guys, I think, can do very, very well without the change of rules. Mm -hmm. But the change of rules really opens it up even much more broadly. Sure. So we touched upon several different applications. I mean, you know, if you look at some of the peer-reviewed literature, Sandia Labs has 17 applications, 26 value streams. So the, the number is really inconsequential. I think there is an idea that you know putting storage out there is going to erode the margins for utilities, but I think you know so much of what we're seeing is the ability to actually have utilities provide better control and better reliability on the grid. We're seeing widespread implementation, or rather more widespread than than in past days, uh, implementation of community energy storage systems to help balance balance voltage profiles and incorporate and absorb more and and greater levels of renewable generation at the distributor level. How do you guys think that affects the utility business model? You know, are we seeing a fundamental change there, or is it going to be business as usual? I know that's a loaded question. It, it, it really is, and, and, and since one of us <laughs> of the paddles worked at a utility, um, the, uh, I'll, I'll pass that to Johannes in a second. I, I, you know, the, 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 this again, though, very much gets to all the regulations that are in place right sure. now, because you know, the, 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 there are certain as aspects where a utility can own energy storage or cannot own energy storage, and one of the, one of the things you have to understand as a backdrop to all this is that the entire utility industry has has historically been regulated in in, in very compartmental ways around generation, mm -hmm. around transmission and distribution, and around load. And energy storage just turns that on its head because it's all three. It, it, it serves the functions of all of them. And so it doesn't fit nicely into the prepackaged way the world looks at the utility industry. Uh, as interestingly, so some saw the smart grid things that change things around too. So, you know, it, it, I, I, inevitably it changes the model some, but, but that has to go with, with how we change policy, regulation, pricing, et cetera, I would, mm -hmm. I would think. But, Johannes, you, you actually work for a utility. Well, <laughs> um, in my extensive experience in utilities, uh, there's one big lesson that I learned, and that is utilities are risk-averse organizations, and they are so for a very good reason, and that is, they are not incentivized to do things for, say, 10% less cost, right? They're incentivized to keep the lights on, 
right? If the lights go off, then they get hammered. Look at what's happening now with Sandy and all the subpoenas and things like that. So, you know, they are naturally risk averse. They are incentivized to be risk averse by their customers and by their regulators. And so um, the sales cycle with utilities when it comes to new technologies is very long. Um, it is sometimes arduous. Sometimes it feels like you're hitting your head on the wall. But the other thing about utilities is they, they mostly have very, very uh, smart people working there. Um, people who know what they're doing, who have been there for a long time. And when you find the right people in the utilities, you can do some very interesting things. So, um, you know, like I say, utilities are risk averse. Sales cycle is long. They think about capital planning in decade time frames, right? They're not looking at what's the next big investment next year, right? They're looking at how is this all evolving over the next 10 years? And then they start to do feelers and pilots and things and get their hands around it. And then they'll, then they'll start to engage. And the other thing is the second they see somebody else making money, doing something that's in their space, you can bet they'll get involved. So, you know, I think it's on those of us who are independent project developers to start to lead, you know, lead their horse to water. And uh, we'll see them jump in. We'll see them start to get more active. But they are very active now, um, but they have a mandate to be risk averse from all of us. And that's something that fundamentally we all need to understand. There, there is one, um, I think, misconception that some people have, which is, that the energy storage market only emerges if the utilities um, actually act upon that. And in fact, New York Best has over 100 member organizations right now. Many of them are developing battery systems, uh, uh, our, our colleagues here. And they, most of them are not planning right now to sell directly to the utilities. Most of them are selling the, into the market in other ways as project developers. And one example that's been given to me is wind farms in the United States are 90% not utility owned. So, it, 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 you know, so, so these kinds of things when they come into the market don't necessarily come into the market under the umbrella of utilities in the beginning. Yeah, and there, you know, it's, it's, being on the wind farm, that's one situation where some regulation work might be needed mm -hmm. because right now, like in certain areas of the country, they build up large amount of wind and uh, they can just sell the wind they can generate and then the utility or the transmission operator needs to deal with the load that they need to serve. So somebody at some point has to figure out a way to offer some balancing mm -hmm. reserve at that point. And yeah. the, the balancing reserve at some level, if the technology price goes down, can be done by independent power providers, simply mm -hmm. like the wind turbines are independent power providers. And that could be a model that could be very lucrative at the end. But in the meantime, until the price of all in installed for energy storage gets to, I don't know, 150 or $200 a kilowatt hour, uh, there is an, it's difficult to think about energy storage for wind integration. And then there's one thing about utilities I like to mention. We, of course, work with the utilities uh, as we can. Uh, and it's the situation over the last two years has changed dramatically, I will say. Uh, Con Edison, uh, Southern California Edison, the Bonnie Will Power Administration, PJM, they all have energy storage demonstrations in the field. You know, they all, they're all doing it. And I think that uh, the drivers, and maybe you can expand on that, and you touched on that, is that they realize that over the next 10, 15 years, the infrastructure cost mm -hmm. will be enormous. So the, the way this usually works, they have to build a case for rate increase. So they put together a list of upgrades that they need on the grid, and they submit it. And that case has to be reasonable and prudent. And if uh, the transformers and the switches and the breakers, all of a sudden, they all get to end of life, and they have to replace piece of equipment by piece of equipment to meet the load peak, then you know we'll see what the rates will become. So I think there is mm -hmm. the utilities at some point will will find a way to adopt some solution. I have two um, small tangents, but I think you may find them interesting. If not, just start throwing your rotten fruit. I know they handed it out earlier, but mm -hmm. um, the uh, the first is on the wind. These gentlemen are uh, exactly right. That is a great example of where regulation is holding back energy storage. Um, basically, energy storage suffers a triple penalty when it comes to wind. The first is that you know, there's an efficient, a round-trip efficiency loss when you install an energy storage device. And so the first problem is, um, well, it's, it's not a problem necessarily for the wind industry. It's just tricky for the energy storage. And that is you get a production tax credit paid per kilowatt hour when you deliver electricity 
to the grid from a, a wind farm. That's a federal production tax rate at 22 cents a kilowatt hour. So if you're putting that energy into an uh, energy storage device and then getting, say, 80 percent out the other side, you're only getting 80 percent of your production tax credit. Similarly, right, similarly, you're, uh, if you're spinning for renewables, if you're you know, generating green credits or rec credits, um, now you're only getting 80 percent of your rec credits, right? And then the third thing um, uh, a colleague just referred to, and that's the um, grid integration costs. So when you have a, a wind farm that's ramping up and down like this, uh, based on when the wind is coming and when it's not, you have to have spinning generation and reserve and, ancil and other ancillary services to back that up. And right now, the cost load bears that cost, load being you and me, right? We pay for that, um, and it's not explicitly passed through to the generator that's creating those problems. And in fact, some politics behind this, there was actually somewhat of a bitter spat between the energy storage organization and the wind organization. You know, people wouldn't talk to one another. It was all kind of fun. Um, that was patched up recently, but that was one of the major reasons. The storage people said, hey, you should bear the cost so that we can make some money, you know, helping you integrate this. And the wind people were like, no way. So that's, that's three, the three major hits that kind of need to be resolved before storage participate with, with wind. The second thing I'll say is expand also. Um, uh, on what utility executives are thinking about rates going up. You know, here in the city of New York, the average person pays somewhere in the range of 24 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, right? You know what the levelized cost of a solar panel is over its lifetime? Somewhere in the, you know, 15 to 18 cent range, right? So if you start thinking about that math, you start realizing that um, these utility executives are going to start waking up and thinking, wait, there's actually disruptive technology out there that's cheaper than the product that I'm offering. And that's what's keeping them up at night. They're seeing that they need to start doing things more, uh, more cost effectively. They can't just keep doing things the same way. So there is some momentum changing there simply because the economics are going that direction. And I'm going to urge everybody to check out uh, Johannes' company's blog. Uh, he's actually got a good segment on what he calls the Catch-22 of project finance for energy storage. So maybe you can explain that a little bit and sort of what you're seeing in terms of, of project finance and how it's different from, you know, financing traditional generation assets. Sure. Well, the Catch-22 is pretty simple. Um, whenever you want to do a, a new technology project and you want to finance it, and it's a big project, say a couple million dollars, um, the first thing you ask that, that incredibly needs to be asked is, will this work? Where's your precedent, right? Well, you don't really have a precedent because it's a new thing, it's a new idea, new business model often, and a new technology, right? So how are you going to get the financing? Um, and then the catch-22 of the other side is, is then you need the financing to build the project in the first place, right? So there's your catch-22 in the utility industry. You need money to build the project. The value is there, right? The value pot is there. It makes sense to do it, but there's not really a precedent there on either the business model or technology side, and that it becomes sort of a chicken and an egg problem. Um, at our company, what, we have, what we're doing is we're doing stage development to combat that problem. In other words, we're not coming out of the gate with a you know, 10 megawatt, 15 hour, you know, 30 million, 40 million dollar project, right? We're doing a couple hundred thousand dollar projects, 500,000 to a million dollar projects behind the meter with three year paybacks with existing technologies. You know? Solve one challenge at a time, ramp up, have a real plan, that, that leads to pipeline growth, that gets you across these barriers. Because there are known barriers, people know what they are. Um, you need to have some technology uh, uh, demonstration. You need to have some, some comfort that this is going to be a ridiculous risk that people are throwing money off, out and, at. And the last thing I would mention that's really important is you've got to make money on these things, right? The other side of risk is reward. So if you've got a new technology and you can make a 25% IR on that technology, you're going to find somebody who wants to invest in that. Right? So it's all these things put together to get, get across this. Uh, we, need, we need precedent and we need financing, but we need financing to get precedent. On the solar part, is, uh, to echo what you're saying, I was at the event like this, in which it was in the, I was in the audience, and there were several uh, utility executives, and somebody asked a question about energy storage. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, there was complete silence. <laughs> Total silence, which I found, you know, just to your point, I mean, they're almost there. If, you know, I, the way I look at it is a 4x problem, <clears throat> half the cost, twice the efficiency, and they're everywhere, yeah. right? That's pretty much where we're at. And there are places uh, where there are very good incentives. In California, I think the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, or something to that effect, 
is giving now 17 cents a kilowatt hour that you sell back through your solar installation, you know, and that, that's making a difference. And so uh, that could be the disruptive driver, you know. And yeah. you know, I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, 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 I just have to uh, defend my utility friends uh, <laughs> with the silence comment. Uh, uh, Con Edison sits on our board of directors, and uh, National Grid and many other uh, utilities have uh, have heavily funded our organization, and and that's because you know there there is a lot of interest in energy storage, and obviously it's not well known across the entire industry yet. So we might have had the wrong executives in front of the panel in that example, but uh, I, I do think there is a lot of interest in the utility space right now to understand this because it solves important problems to them. I think there are challenges, they just don't know how the financing works yet for them in for many cases. Yeah, what I meant is just, you know, that solar energy could be that technology that forces them to deal with something different. Right. And so I think Absolutely. they are all working toward the day in which that will happen. That's yep. one of the things that they need to consider at the end. Right. That's right. We've seen uh, solar third-party financing really turn the industry, at least for residential solar, on its head. Are we seeing new ownership models emerge for energy storage? You know, we've sort of beaten the horse of the utility industry. Are there new potential owners of storage projects and new value streams that can be had out there? Well, I think Johannes articulated the challenge with with project financing, and, sure. and uh, you know, so 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 some of the companies that are well capitalized themselves have taken the approach of of being their own project financer. So one of the one of the better examples as AES Energy sure. Storage, you know, that that has put in a lot of very large storage sites, and they've taken the approach of of being their own project financer and, 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 and entering into and, and operating the site themselves um, and have the wherewithal to do that. And there are a few other companies in the field that have the wherewithal to do that. Um, for most of the startup companies, it, it really needs to be this kind of gradual work your way up for the smaller projects. And, and some of them, I think, are being successful in that. Yeah, and um, one other things that you find is talking about the smaller projects sometimes is Surprisingly enough, even in the United States, there is still value in power quality. Mm -hmm. So power quality projects are where uh, energy storage can help and where the value to the customer could be sometimes in the thousands of dollars, right? They have a small uh, blip in their car and there is a process. In their process, especially if it's an industrial facility, their industrial process stops and they have to go into long cleanup and restoring modes. So that's where uh, energy storage has some potential and there are there are islands of opportunity behind the meter yeah. I, to you directly to your solar financing question i actually think it's somewhat dangerous to try to cross apply different types of green technologies with one another um in in the example of solar financing you know that's really based on two pieces right one piece is the tax equity in other words rich people who have big tax bills want places to park their money where they don't have to pay a lot of tax and there are great tax benefits to putting in solar. There are no tax benefits for storage. So there's no tax equity play for storage financing. Um, and by the way, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think that that means that we have to stand on our own two legs and we have to make projects that make sense for people. Um, and at the end of the day, that's going to make for a much more robust industry than if we're basing this on a you know 20 percent uh, ITC. Wow. Um, and the second fa facet of that is a securitized income stream, right? If you put a solar panel on your house, and you're in a certain you know, solar incidence area, you can kind of project exactly how much energy is going to be produced by that so solar panel, lock it in, turn it into a financial instrument, and sell it off. Um, with energy storage, that is theoretically possible, although, of course, you're not generating any electricity. You're just shifting it around and monetizing the cost. So there are definitely some financing schemes that can be worked on the contractual side. And, in fact, um, if people really want to get into this, you can seek me out afterwards, and I can put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know the way we do it we look at historic data right that's how you build the ROI yeah. historic 50, yeah. you know and we, we have seen a couple of cases where, where where projects have been bank financeable um but but they've generally been where they've been bundled with other things mm -hmm. oh you want to get into this <laughs> <laughs> no not really <laughs> <laughs> no the, the key the key to building energy storage projects is to have a financeable revenue stream and you know participating in an energy market where there's a spread between on and off peak sorry not financeable right 
Participating in an ancillary service market, definitely not financeable. I mean, the ancillary service market in, in New York City or in the New York ISO, two to 300 megawatts, you know. You put in 20 megawatts, you just crush your own market. Um, so that's, 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 you know, not going to work. Um, uh, you know, anything that's got these market, we at Convergent, we talk about the cake. You know, what's your anchor value stream? And we have a lot of ideas what that, that anchor value stream and a lot of people who are interested in, you know, subscribing and signing contracts for those anchor value streams. And then you use that market as the icing on the cake, right? The difference between on and off peak energy, the capacity value, the answer service value, that's how you boost your ROIs, how you add a little bit of, uh, you juice up your returns, but it's not where you're going to anchor your projects. That's going to be your infrastructure value, your reliability value, those things. You brought up something I definitely wanted to talk about. You know, we mentioned uh, Frick 755 a little bit before, and even looking at a market like PJM, you're seeing, you know, maybe a, a gigawatt of frequency regulation service. Is a, a regulatory decision like that, is it a step in the right direction or is it a temporary crutch, you know, hoping we can get a little controversy going in this one? I, I think there's been a recognition that, that um, you know, frequency regulation was a, was a interesting, or is an interesting early market for energy storage, but it's probably not the main market for energy storage. Sure. And, and so, uh, you know, I think Johanna's just pointed out, it's an it's a, it's a inherently limited market. Um, so 755 did a good thing mm -hmm. to take a market that um, was, was not very economical in a number of the ISOs, to something that uh, is more economical, in some cases attractive, but it's still a fairly small market compared to the broad market of energy storage. And, you know, and, and, and for the broad market, you've got to get to all the other benefits uh, that energy storage uh, addresses, and it's got to address you know, peak demand, it's got to address the other things where, where it really is making a large difference, and you're not talking about 200 megawatts, you're talking right. about gigawatts. Yeah, frequency regulation has been saturated. It gets saturated yeah. quickly. And what the regulation did, it made it possible for the best technology to compete on a level field. And I think AES has done a fantastic job there, right? Forward-looking, making the commercial investment, right. waiting but, for the but regulation. But, you know, I mean, the important thing there is you know, if, 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 if you look at the projects AES has been addressing mm -hmm. recently, They've shifted from oh, yeah. frequency regulation to capacity, yep. to peak storage, to those things. They got things. completely killed. So. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't the, go that far. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're trying to be controversial. Okay, <laughs> I'm trying yeah, to be controversial. Yeah, but but yeah. I mean, look at the prices, $8 a megawatt yeah. hour. There's no way you make money back on that. Yeah. I think at PJM, they're doing a little better. <laughs> well, now, yeah, yeah. So. Take a question from the audience. So uh, we had a question that's, there's many storage uh, companies and startups that are approaching commercialization. Is the market ripe for consolidation once we see, you know, more widespread commercialization of these companies? I know that's a tough question, but... <laughs> there aren't a lot of companies to acquire one another yet. Sure. Um, there's a lot of startups. And, I mean, you, 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 I think any new industry, mm -hmm. you, you always see some consolidation, right? And, and so GE recently built a, a, a large battery plant in New York State. And um, you know this. This I think is a, it was an interesting step because they 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 recognize the value of having manufacturing near the technology development, so they put it here in New York State as opposed to it in a in an overseas location. The crux of that of that technology was an acquisition by GE of a small company. Yeah. So it's it, so you know you see some of those things happen. We'll probably see a lot more happen. But I, th I think the things have to emerge more before we're going to see a lot of activity sure. in that area. You know, from a technology landscape standpoint, when you look at the energy storage, which at the end are batteries, right? I mean, there are some very well-established battery makers. I mean, these people have been making lead-acid batteries forever. And some of these lead-acid batteries are really good. Mm -hmm. And they last for thousands of cycles. And you can discharge them gently, but more aggressively than, than your traditional car battery. That's one end of the spectrum. These are the low-cost batteries, right? At the other end of the, end of the spectrum, there is the lithium-ion batteries that are expensive, but they pack a lot of energy. They can be discharged really fast, uh, and they have some safety issue, you know, as, 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 as we all know. <laughs> so in the middle, between the lead acid and the lithium-ion, that are the market leaders, you know, they're in, the incumbent looking, looking for this technology. There's a bunch of startups. Mm -hmm. And now the question for the startup, for the, for the landscape, the technical landscape is 
who outside of the lab can build a battery that costs like lead acid mm -hmm. and works at it can be discharged relatively fast, like in half an hour or so. So that to some level, you need the battery at the price of a lead acid for, with some of the performance of a lithium ion that is safe and it lasts 30 years. Right? Mm -hmm. And there is literally, it's beautiful, there is literally companies popping up every day right? with different chemistries and different approaches. And then we all go in the field and we find that the application requirements are a little bit more complicated than they were in the lab. Luckily, at being at the university, we took we look, took a look at that a little bit earlier. And so once the applications are better, required, better understood, then a couple, uh, uh, couple of companies will start getting some traction, and maybe mm -hmm. lead acid companies will buy <laughs> some of these new technologies. You know, sure. we don't have, you know, there are very well-established market leaders in batteries today. Uh, it's not that it's a brand new industry. Yeah, it, it, is, it is noteworthy that, that all of the major companies that make electrical equipment for the grid have significant energy storage efforts going on right now. So GE, Siemens, ABB, Toshiba, they all have significant energy storage activities going on. And, and, I, and I would fully expect that you'd see acquisitions from them in the future. Mm -hmm. But it's going to take a little while. So there's a second part to this question, actually. What are some of the competencies that separate the winners from the losers in this market? And this, this touches a point that I was hoping we'd get into is, you know, mm -hmm. these sort of false metrics of cost per kilowatt, cost per kilowatt hour. Can those even be applied across the industry or is that somewhat of a fallacy? Well, there are a lot of parameters you need to evaluate on a battery, right? Sure. You need to look at what's its charge and discharge capacity, you know, the pipe that you put, that you can put energy in and out of the thing. You know, what's the duration of the charge and discharge at that capacity? What's the cycle life of that battery? So how many times can you charge and discharge it? What's the depth of discharge? How deeply can you discharge that? And what's the efficiency rate? So how much do you get out from what you put into it, right? And so all those things, it's a great big matrix, you know, of trying to shuffle all those around to make apples to apples. And it gets tricky, but, um, you know, it's, it's not it's not insurmountable, all of those, those different challenges to figure out what battery works and what battery doesn't for you. Personally, um, and based on the analysis that we've done, I see there are a couple of things that stand out among what you really need to make a battery project successful. The first is cost for energy. I am absolutely, and we, are, we have got, we got a lot of data here that says that the big market opportunities are gonna be for batteries that have four to six hours of discharge, right? Fundamentally, these energy plays which are about displacing infrastructure, you know, displacing a peak, period, or providing reliability for a building for several hours. You know, those are the type of things that, that's the type of battery that, that doesn't really exist now that's going to need to start ramping up in the future. There are some batteries that, that can do it, but, um, you know, that's the thing that's really missing that, that a lot of companies are trying to address. And that needs to be cheap, it needs to be safe, it needs to be energy dense, you know, oh yeah, I forgot density, right? You can't have an enormous sprawling thing in the middle of Manhattan, right? So you, all this thing, interestingly, there are some things that matter maybe a little less, right? One of the things I used to think was really important was round trip efficiency. But if you're doing an infrastructure play, right? If you're saying this battery is here to supply me what would otherwise, I'd have to spend a lot of money to upgrade this wire and this transformer and this circuit and all this other stuff, dig up the street, all that kind of thing, then you're not really cycling that battery all that much and efficiency becomes not really that important. So applications, is, as, as we're all saying up here, applications, batteries, you have to match them together. It's hard to just say, let's take a table of all the batteries and pick which one's the best, you know? You gotta match them up. Yeah, so if you take your four, to four hours, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at it. So say you want to shave 100 kilowatt for four hours. You mm -hmm. need at least four or 500 kilowatt four hours, hours. Yeah. of energy. And so when you look at the value stream, that tells you the price of the battery has to be two, $300 a kilowatt hour, well, yeah. kind of. That's where, where it comes down to, which is the price of a lead acid. And, mm -hmm. and that's what the market is trying to do. And volumes are, are, are a big, uh, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. are, are a very big uh, factor. And it comes down at the end. 
you almost need to run little simulations every time to understand how your mm -hmm. batteries need to work. So that's the level of sophistication that the industry is getting to. When you pro put the proposal together for somebody, you actually need to run the MATLAB simulations to tell them yeah. how much time it will take them to recover their cost. To give you an example, one of our first hires at, at Convergent was not a you know, former energy executive or a... Um, you know, somebody who really knew the regulatory environment or anything like that. It was a computer programmer. I, I love the hmms. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Which is even a bigger problem because computer programmers are expensive and the batteries need to be cheap. <laughs> so you hired a computer programmer lately? No. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we've had an admittedly uh, biased conversation towards battery storage. We've had a couple of questions from the audience addressing thermal storage, hydrogen fuel cells. How do you see those applications fitting into the larger mix of energy storage? So, 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 I, so I guess I should put the disclaimer first that uh, New York Battery Energy Storage Technology Consortium, its name says battery and energy storage for a reason. And, and out of our 120 or so members, a good number of them are doing non-battery types of storage, things like thermal storage, things like fuel cells, et cetera. And, you know, we've, we've heard the whole talk here, the, uh, you know, I like the term earlier, horses for courses, you know, the, the, the fact that all of these things have different attributes. Um, and, uh, you know, there, 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 are, there are a number of different places where uh, thermal storage makes a lot of sense and, um, and, and in fact, can be, uh, can be quite cost effective. Um, fuel cells are still being, uh, you know, being developed for various different things. And, uh, um, you know, actually there was a you know, wonderful announcement just recently in the auto sector of, uh, uh, of, of major advancements in, in that area. So, you know, we're, start, we're, we're continuing to see those, those developments happen as well. Um, I think the 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 um, the on grid applications, you know, for, for fuel cells are probably a little bit less. They're probably more geared toward transportation and for smaller like portable power applications. Um, whereas thermal storage, there's some really good on grid applications. I like like the company that was mentioned. That we got a little uh, write up, and this is company Lightsail. Mm -hmm. And that's a great. Uh, that, that's just a, a great example of innovation where they're using a. This is basically a similar to compress air storage, where basically instead of having electrochemical storage, you basically compress the air, but that usually generates heat that gets lost, and so the efficiency of compressed air is very low typically. But what they're doing now, they're storing that heat by spraying water when they compress the gas and storing that heat in the water and then they recover it at the expansion so that they get a higher efficiency. That's um, a clever thermodynamic trick. And uh, of course, their cost right now is very high and, you know, and they need to solve manufacturing issues. But it's um, incredible to see how many different approaches there are. I talked to a guy in California last year, and I don't know if he got his project financed, but the idea is not bad. There is a place that California has this very large uh, solar panel installation. So what, what this person was trying to uh, get financed is this, uh, there was a place in the desert that had a slope. So he wanted to take literally trains mm -hmm. up the slope, right, to store energy. And then the train will come down the slope and release the energy. I mean, why not? Yeah. Right? You can really store megawatt hour of energy that way. So there is a whole universe of ideas. I mean, you, sh you should bear in mind that historically in the United States, energy storage has been pumped high grow. It mm -hmm. hasn't been batteries. So, so, so you know, there are already other technologies being used. And, and some of these actually are... Uh, are, are quite viable. I and mean, there's, a, there's a project uh, planned for off the coast of Belgium where they're actually making an island to do pumped hydro mm -hmm. in, in the middle of the North Sea. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, very, very innovative things that are going on in the field right now. I think the advantage of electrochemical energy storage is the modularity, though, is that you Absolutely. really can decide, you know, I need a little bit here yeah. or I need a lot there. And so that helps with marketing these devices at different scales. Yeah. I think one of the, the misconceptions that we should probably clear up, too, is the fact that storage isn't really competing against storage right now. We have other technologies as well. You know, we're in a, an era of historically low natural gas prices, mm -hmm. and we have demand response playing a bigger role in markets right now. How does that fit in, and how do you see uh, sort of the, the role or rather the deployment of storage being either slowed down or sped up with those, those current situations? 
Um, no, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to be contrarian here. I actually don't think that the price of natural gas has all that much to do with energy storage project opportunities um, at the end of the day. I think it may marginally affect the cost of building new capacity if you have to replace a peaker, but that's a you know, longer-term thing, and it may marginally affect some of the average energy prices. But remember, what makes storage valuable is the difference between on and off peak and the infrastructure value. Right. right. And so if you've got an infrastructure constraint, low or high natural gas prices is not solving that. The fact that I could get free natural gas and it wouldn't keep the lights of my building on if the grid goes down. Right. So, you know, you have to find a lot of the high value applications are not necessarily sensitive to, you know, the average price of electricity. It's about the, the volatility of those prices. And we yes. see that in the field. You know, it's mm -hmm. the congestion that comes. Near yeah. the load, you can't really, uh, it doesn't matter. You can't even sometimes permit some of these yeah, generators. Okay. And the other point is uh, demand response programs instead, I think they're just great. Mm -hmm. For a city like New York City, they're, mm -hmm. they're great. There are companies, uh, two or three companies, and now they are playing with the settings of, the, you know, wh when, you, when you have air conditioning, what you gotta do first, you have to undercool the air, so mm -hmm. to make it really, really dry. And then you have to heat it up a little bit which is kind of counterintuitive somehow, right? Because you're trying to give air conditioning the some. There are companies that are playing with those settings. They are giving savings of 25, 30%. I mean, that, those are the low-hanging fruits. DR is going to do a lot of good work in New York City for that. I agree with that. You know, there's an interesting argument that uh, right now, getting back to the fact that our grid is very lightly used, and, mm -hmm. it, 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 and, and the interesting thing is natural gas is the variable on that. So we run our nuclear plants, we run our coal mm -hmm. plants, and we vary with the natural gas. When natural gas gets cheaper and cheaper, that turns on its head. You'd rather turn down other things, mm -hmm. but they're not really designed for it. So suddenly, actually, mm -hmm. there's an argument to be made that we'd much rather run our natural gas plants full out and put energy storage as the variable. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I'm not, I, I think that there, there's a, there really is an argument that, 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 that as Johannes was uh, is indicating, that natural gas may not drive it, and, and Valerio, natural gas may not drive it that much. I think there's another piece here I'd like mm -hmm. to, 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 to bring to the equation, which is, I had the pleasure of serving on one of the, uh, the three commissions Governor Cuomo set up post uh, Superstorm Sandy um, of, of looking at how we can be more prepared and how we can make a more resilient grid going forward. And, you know, the, the outcome of that work is, 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 is going to be a very heavy look at how we can create um, value for things like resiliency. You know, so if you have a gas station with a solar panel and energy storage for the four to six hours, mm -hmm. you know, or even longer, you know, suddenly now you have, you, have, you have something that actually creates power islands in an emergency. You know, you have other things that you have other value that's being created. Um, those things end up being the, the pieces that will drive a lot, of, a lot of new markets that may open up in the near term. And I think your, your, your point is right. We're competing against the grid. We're not competing against energy storage in this mm -hmm. case. Sure. Take another question from the audience. Don't take that personally, by the way, the natural gas question. No, I tend to agree <laughs> with you, but I had to educate her to populism a little bit. <laughs> so a question from the audience. Balance Maybe we are in denial, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, balance of plant components for energy storage systems can be a major portion of installed cost. Where have you seen constraints and where have you seen innovation outside the seller pack? For example, thermal management, battery management, inverters, et cetera. <laughs> you know, we, we have done installations uh, over the last couple of years, and when we first started, we were actually shocked to, find, to see how expensive these mm -hmm. ACDC inverters are. They, they had very significant price, especially in these high-value mm -hmm. installations where you need to deliver more power because the inverter, you pay by the kilowatt. You don't pay it by the... Mm -hmm by the kilowatt hour, right? So it just, um, it compounds on the cost. But even that is, ch is changing, I would say, over the last two years. We have worked, and I'm going to just mention a company that is a New Jersey company. Mm -hmm. We're working with Princeton Power System. They have excellent products. It's fairly reasonably priced. And, mm -hmm. But ABB is coming up with products now, and mm -hmm. all the major vendors have products. And what's happening, because the application demands are so complex, mm -hmm. and you need to deliver power Every second almost, you need the battery needs to discharge a different amount of power. All these ACDC inverters now have to be programmable. Mm -hmm. So there is a whole part of interfacing with the inverters. 
and what programming languages they accept is more computer scientists, right? Mm -hmm. And the other part, which all these new chemistries need, are what's called battery management systems, which is you still need to operate the batteries so that they don't break or don't explode or whatever it is. That's uh, and so we are finding, w and those are all technical issues mm -hmm. that can that can be solved. You know, those are the system integration issues that every vendor has addressed over the last two years, and I think most vendors now got them down. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the third part, of course, especially in New York, and I'd like to hear your comment on that, is the price of real estate in which you have to put these batteries. Mm -hmm. right? And we find places in which rather put a battery, they can put some storage for tenants of the building and make more money by renting the storage. Right? So that also slows down somehow, the cost of installation and finding the space. It is interesting, though, that you know, the point you just made, Larry, about the electronics, this is one place where we're seeing cross-pollinization benefit. I mean, if you think about the solar industry, the, for a long time, the emphasis on solar industry was getting solar panels cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And you know, now there's a great deal of emphasis on getting the electronics mm -hmm. cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And they're not exactly the same, but they incredibly relate to each other with battery mm -hmm. systems. So, so the companies that are doing that, I think we're seeing, uh, we're seeing that balance plant coming down in price derivatively from partially from the solar industry. Yeah. You know, we, we did a kind of a perverse exercise, I suppose, um, if I wanted to keep myself up at night, in costing out the components inside of an inverter. And it's somewhere between 7 and 15 cents of components and labor that go into an inverter. Standard inverters now cost somewhere between 50 cents and 75 cents, maybe even a dollar, dollar twenty per, per watt. Right, so it's inevitable that this is going to go down closer to the twenty cent range, the fifteen cent range per watt, with all the capabilities that we need. Um, it's just a matter of how long it takes to get there and who eats each other doing it. Um, and uh, so that that's that's going to happen. But I would like to speak on the development cost side of this. You know, one of the reasons why we demand that kind of two hundred, two hundred fifty dollar max, three hundred dollar per kilowatt hour cost is because the battery in a lot of these installs is actually the minority portion of the cost of an in installing a battery. You know, putting a battery inside of a building here in Manhattan, buying the battery is the least of your worries. Um, uh, and in fact, we think that's actually a competitive advantage for convergent because we know how to do that and most people don't. So, um, you know, I'm not complaining about that, but uh, it, is, it is, you know, the hard and soft construction costs, the integration of the power electronics, the power electronic integration on the AC side to either the building of the grid and then the power electronic integration to the battery, the DC side on, on the, the, the technology side. I mean, all this stuff has to be put together and integrated. Um, and it takes, it's a challenge. But uh, if there's value, you know, they'll build a baseball stadium. It seems also, and you guys can comment on this much better than I can, but there's an increasing trend of vendor neutrality for these balance of system components. Valeria are shaking your head now. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the standards are becoming, are, are starting to emerge, right? But we still, you know, we bought some inverters like last year and their Modbus interface wouldn't work and, <laughs> you know, and that wasn't fun. <laughs> So we touched uh, upon grid-connected storage pretty extensively. What are the opportunities like for off-grid? This comes from the audience. Well, I, 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 I guess one thing is, you know, there, there's, there's, there, there's on-grid and then islandable. Sure. Which, 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 which we haven't really ta talked a lot about yet. But, but one of the, one of the fundamental differences, I think, that we're, we're, we're seeing on the, on the on-grid stuff is that historically, Utilities have always strongly preferred um, uh, de distributed generation energy storage not to be islandable. So when the power goes down, they go down. You know, so there's a wonderful article in the New York Times that you know when the power went down that you know all these people with solar panels no power. Well, that's because you know not islandable. So you know that's very likely to change. You know because obviously a lot of value is to be able to stay up in that kind of a thing, and and so that has to be worked through. So they become off grid, but but only when the grid's down. Um, for 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 further off grid, you know, w one of the one of the main drivers actually in the energy storage industry right now is the military. Mm -hmm. um, we the U.S. military has recognized two things. One is that um, their costs for energy 
um, uh, in, in the operating theater are very, very high, and they need to be more efficient, and energy storage and microgrids do that for them. But two, their reliance on energy, even in, in bases here in the U.S., they're very worried about the, the about you know power outages and all that affecting them. So, so they have been uh, moving very rapidly to put in microgrids with energy storage um, that have been a a, a, a market leader in, in driving some of these technologies that, that are truly off-grid applications. Actually, energy storage in that application saves lives, right? Yeah. Because it decreases the amount of diesel fuel you need to run some of these bases. You can run diesel generators more efficiently by storing excess energy in the batteries and then you use those, the energy in the battery that way so that you don't have to transport so much fuel uh, along um, lines. Now, on uh, off-grid, really off-grid, I've talked to two people who are building it, and it's, uh, it's surprising. Different parts of the country, they're buying the same components. They're buying solar panels from China at a relatively low price. They're buying another plug for another company, Outback Inverters, mm -hmm. that work really well, and they're buying Exide uh, batteries. Mm -hmm. And they can do it. They say seven years, ten years, they break even. So of, in some remote areas, even in the U.S., it makes sense right now to do it. Another large, large market overseas right now um, are uh, are off grid cell towers. Sure. Um, the the uh, uh, so I mentioned G's battery factory here in New York. Uh, a, a major portion of their output is going to overseas cell towers to be coupled with diesel generators to work mm -hmm. more efficiently. So and and you know that's a actually becoming a sizable market. Mm -hmm. I, I think they've uh, my colleagues here have very aptly discuss some of the off-off grid, and I'd like to comment very quickly on batteries and reliability and the military. You know, the military is the largest customer for electricity, so while there are all the, you know, security and forward deployment issues that they're looking for for energy storage, they also just buy a huge amount of electricity, and they're facing big budget constraints. So I actually had a, you know, one, uh, we were working with a, a general, a Marine general recently, he was talking with the Marine general about his value proposition at his base. And it was pretty simple. And he sounded like a build, building owner here in Manhattan, only with one major difference. He said, every dollar that I don't spend on electricity is a dollar I can use to train Marines. You know, right out of central casting, this guy. So, um, you know, so they're, they're like a lot of the other customers we're dealing with. Maybe more paperwork, but... Um, they're like a lot of other customers we're dealing with. On the reliability piece, you know, the, when, when we're talking about reliability and batteries, we need to be pretty upfront about what we're talking about here, right? Um, the first question that I ask when somebody says reliability and batteries or something in, with those two words in a sentence is what type of reliability, right? If you're looking for something that's going to run your tenant load for an indefinite amount of time, I can't help you with that, with a battery. If you're looking for... The power goes out, and I need to keep my emergency systems going. I need to, I'd love to have some elevators and the emergency stair lighting going to get people in and out of the building, you know, a couple of hours. Then give me a call. I'll give you my cell phone number, you know. Then call me anytime. Um, and that's the sort of thing that we can do with batteries, and we can do it very well, and we can do it a lot cheaper than most on other solutions. Um, and, you know, we're developing concepts at Convergent where we can do that and provide you the economic um, value proposition at the same time. So you can kind of run these things um, for economics, and then you can also have reserve to, to, to um, provide you with that, you know, the reliability, that limited reliability you need. So those are my two comments on that issue. Sarah has a question. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, just wanted to give you a, a sense of how the Twitter feed is going. A um, lot of action. Uh, Micah has asked how come uh, FERC755, hashtag FERC755, isn't trending on Twitter. So everyone, if you just do hashtag FERC755, we might be able to make that happen. Um, and actually, we have somebody t watching from Brazil. I think it's our first person watching from Brazil. So that's yeah. very, Rafael, from <laughs> very exciting. Um, actually, bringing a question to you guys from Adam Aston, who was a moderator for our Energy Water Nexus event um, in September 2011. So he is watching online, and he had a question. I might butcher this. Um, about vehicle to grid, he wants to know about the barriers, the promise, and the status of the trials. So take it away. 
so the, 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 I guess uh, that's, a, that's a very big question. Um, the, you know, when, when you, if you step forward and look at uh, if we have significant electric vehicle penetration or even plug-in hybrid penetration, suddenly everybody has energy storage. You know, so, so, so at their home. They have a, a decent-sized battery system at their home. And so one of the, the uh, things that is being explored is could you utilize that? Could you tie it to the home so instead of just charging the vehicle, could you actually sometimes pull the vehicle uh, to charge out of it and use it to power your house in an emergency situation? So, you know, if you have a solar panel on your house, you have a vehicle, you, you tie these together. And in fact, you know, the, the, the numbers work. You know, if you, have a, if you have a Tesla or a Chevy Volt or something with a decent sized battery in it, there's actually a fair amount of energy for powering a typical house to be able to ride you through something like that. Um, the, the, there, there have been a couple demonstrations. New York State is looking at a lot more demonstrations. This was a recommendation out of the, uh, out of the uh, 2100 Commission in New York State uh, to do demonstrations in this area. There are a number of challenges with doing this. Um, one, of course, is that batteries have a finite lifetime, and you know, if you if you if you paid for putting a battery into a car, you know, that is a battery. When we get to the horses for courses thing we just talked about, that is a battery that was fully designed for the car. Mm -hmm. Do you want to use it to power your house from an economics perspective? Sure, in an emergency, you absolutely do. Mm -hmm. Daily, maybe not. So this may only be an emergency situation, but if the inverters and the electronics are reasonably priced, it could be that that works great for emergencies, and it does exactly that. And that's what some of these demonstrations are, are I think, targeted to look at. So from my perspective, I think it's an interesting opportunity. I think it also brings up a, a broader question, which is, is remarkably interesting, which is the fact that, you know, if you just step back and look at our energy system, we have two distinct energy systems. We have the transportation energy system and the electricity grid energy system, and they're both roughly the same size. What happens when you start to have electric vehicles? You know, you've now turned this whole thing on its head. You've now shifted an incredible amount from the one to the other, which is, which, you know, if you have any major penetration, is going to have huge ramifications on the grid. So it's reasonable to start to think about these things, but they're, I think, a ways off. When I was at SE, I used to field this question all the time, and my answer was always the same. It was, let's start with be, being able to control or incentivize just the charging behavior of the individual consumer. Then we can talk about discharging back to the grid, right? So it's almost like a stepwise process where the first step was just incentivizing people not to charge their car during the peak hour of the peak day of the peak year and blowing their transformer. Um, and that was the major, that was like all the utility messaging was around that point. Um, and it, you know, the reasonable estimates that that is going to take a long time just to get in hand the charging behavior of consumers in their vehicles and how that affects the grid and how that might help and harm the grid. Um, now talking about discharging back into the grid and all the protocols re required there and um, there are a lot of challenges related to that and I think um, Bill has very um, has summarized those very well. And one other issue discharging into the grid is that as much as you like to change the behavior of the consumer, most consumers need to charge during the day. Mm -hmm. They drive to work, yes. they need to charge, exactly so they can right. go home. <laughs> right? and, and they can discharge into the grid at night where nobody <laughs> needs it. <laughs> So th there's People some. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, there's some work there. No, there is the argument you put the charger in the home and you just flip that, right? Charge at night. And yeah, yeah, but I was. No, but I you know, when the grid needs it, you're driving your car around. You That's see, like point. some so, of this car, okay. you have 40 miles driving right, range. Right. You come to New York City, you park, and you, yep. you, you have to charge. Yep. Right? yep. So that's, I guess, the main problem. We, uh, we discussed, you know, articulating the benefits for regul regulators and having the ability to sort of uh, show value or demonstrate value for regulatory and the policy side of the equation. In smart grid, kind of what we've been seeing, at least on, on my side of the research, is that there's been difficulty uh, expressing the value to consumers. Is there a similar element in storage, you know, as we look at more distributed storage? I, I, there, there certainly is a difficulty in, in putting a monetary number on the value of certain aspects of it. So, so when, when, when you put an energy storage device in a building in Manhattan, or if you did a large project like AA is proposed on, on Long Island of putting large energy storage there that um, is going to 
peak shave, it's going to, uh, at some scale, start to eliminate the need to put in peaker plants. It's going to, at some scale, start to eliminate the need to run new, new transmission lines and distribution networks. It's going to potentially offset the need for um, upgrades to substations. It's going to do all kinds of good societally for us. And right now, there are only a few vehicles by which to monetize that. Now, I hasten to say that in certain cases, those vehicles to monetize it are good enough. To, 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 not not to, to, to be <laughs> attacked by my left here that, that they have, don't have a business. They do have a business. But the fact is they're doing more good than they're getting credit for. And, and so they're doing a lot more good than they're getting credit for. And, and we need to understand how to do that. We can explain it, I think, pretty well from a, a two people that are at least knowledgeable about the grid. The, the, you know, the ISO gets it, the utilities get it, um, but what they don't necessarily get yet is, is you know, how do you then distribute that value in a way that you can then monetize it, which is why your 755 FERC was a step for the one aspect of it. There might be ways under FERC 1000 to start to look at some of the transmission part of it, but these are all big questions. The other big question is resiliency. Um, you know, one answer for resiliency is you just put backup diesel generators everywhere around the grid. You know, that, you know, works if you just want to turn the lights on and that, that two days the grid's down, but you spend a lot of money to do something for two days a year, mm -hmm. and it didn't do you any other good. You know, if you put distributed generation and microgrids with energy storage, then you're doing all this peak shaving, you're doing all these other things all year long, and hey, by the way, when the lights go off, it fixes it. Mm -hmm. So, but right now, no one gets paid for fixing it when the light goes off. You know, the individual business, uh, you know, building owner might care. The but, beauty of avoided cost, my friend. Yeah, okay. so, so, so those are the things that we, we, we need to work on, and I think the good news is that New York State is recognizing this following Sandy and is tasking the PSC to tackle some of these things this year. So I guess, uh, sorry, the, Johannes, go ahead. Yeah, the, the energy storage business case is there are many different applications and many different customers and many different specific installations. So it's very complex. There's a lot to know. But it actually is very simple, right? It comes down to two things, basically. It's finding the right technology for the right application, knowing what your application is, right? And the other thing is coupling value streams. I cannot say this forcefully enough, right? You need to be able to not hang your hat on just one revenue stream. You have to monetize several different things. And monetizing means two things. It means you're actually getting paid to do that, and it also means you're avoiding what you, but for that battery, you would have had to pay that. That's just as legitimate as getting, you know, a dollar coming in. It's not spending a dollar. And you can put together really compelling cases around three basic metrics we like to think about you need energy value. That's when you're operating the device. What are you accruing in terms of you know, your operating profits and revenues? Your capacity value. So that's where you're talking about generation and there are generators. You need to uh, keep a certain amount of generation around just to make sure that you're ready for the peak day. And then infrastructure value. And infrastructure value could be that reliability portion. It could be that you don't have to uh, upgrade that 15-mile-long underground circuit. It could be, you know, a whole variety of things. But fundamentally, you need to tap into all three of those in a project development. If you've just taken one, you need to take a step back and, you know, um, don't call your bank just yet. Yeah, and then at the end, you know, if both our organization need the computer scientist to put together an, mm -hmm. a, a proposal to a customer, there is some complexity in building the case, but... I agree with you, there are simple ways to explain the multiple yeah. values to the customer. And, uh, you know, and what makes this exciting is that really nobody at the end really knows where, what the best models are going to be. And that's what makes it, I think, so exciting to be in the yeah. industry right now. And the customer pitch basically is, is pretty simple. It comes down to two things, right? But well, depending on your application. But let's say I'm talking to a building owner. Let's just talk about it behind the meter or beyond the meter storage device. The customer pitch is, I will save you money over this amount of years. You'll get a payback, right? Or um, when your lights go out, I will help you. You know, it's, it, it boils down to some pretty intuitive things. Now, do those things fluctuate in value? Yes, the old adage in the utility industry is uh, reliability is either worth nothing or it's worth everything, right? None of you want to pay for reliability until your lights go out. Then you're willing to pay just about anything. So 
Um, sorry, I don't mean to generalize. I'm sure there's some very nice reliability payers in the audience. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that, so there are, right now is a great time to be in the reliability play in the energy storage industry. So we're just reaching the, uh, the half hour mark. Uh, there's some great remarks to close on, but I'll leave one more minute if anybody wants to put in a last comment. Thank you. Thank great. you. Thank yeah, you. It was good. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Johannes. Thanks, Valeria. It was a great yeah. panel. And everyone, let's say thank you to Zach. Did a great right. job as a moderator. Thanks, Zach. Thank you to the in-person and online audience for watching tonight. If your question didn't get answered by Zach or by me via the Twitter feed, feel free to ask the panelists. They're going to be up here taking questions. Uh, and thank you for coming, and I hope you guys come back in May. Have a great one. And now time for wine and beer.